Lorenzo, the floor to you. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to, to comment um, this uh, uh, research on the experience of the IMF in the Eurozone crisis. I will try uh, for the purpose of the um, debate to take a, a different position and to um, maybe look a bit more um, political. The um, IMF has always been in an ambiguous position. Is it a technical institution or is it a political institution? It's very difficult to, to say in theory it should be independent, the staff is independent, but then the board um, is made of people who, when they take their position, have to report to their parliaments, to the governments. For sure, this is the case of the US. It was the case of Italy when I was in the Treasury. The Italian uh, executive director would uh, uh, take instructions from, from the Italian government. Is this correct or not? This is a matter of fact, because it is taxpayers' money. So um, this is an important issue, and it has been the history of the IMF to change its developments, its rules. It was mentioned in the Mexican crisis, which was a crisis at the border of the US. And uh, the IMF changed the rules under the influence of the US. I would say, you could say, under the imposition of the US. And not, nobody really blamed anybody else, because the world was changing. It was rationalized intellectually by the fact that we now suddenly discovered that there were capital account crises, not only current account crises. So the IMF had to evolve to uh, serve the interests of its shareholders. Like it or not, uh, this was what the shareholders wanted. So the alternative view to the one which uh, Susan uh, uh, presented would be that the IMF, if it wants to remain relevant in the world, has to adjust to um, the new environment in which one of its biggest, the biggest member actually, has changed in nature and if it wants to be relevant, it has to be flexible. Um, in Europe, of course, we are not that smart as to ask that formally, as the, IMA, as the US did after the Mexican crisis. The US basically asked all the other shareholders to change the rules. Europeans are a bit slow, they are not that well organized, but maybe uh, uh, we could do that if we were speaking with one voice. In fact, uh, Europe did not want the IMF to manage the crisis. I, when I was at the ECB in 2010, I was against the IMF being in the crisis. Uh, Trichet was against, for a very simple reason. Uh, we thought a currency which, when it is in a, a situation of crisis, asks for the IMF to get in, is not very efficient from a managerial and uh, uh, governance point of view. We had the European Commission, who was supposed to be experienced in the field of um, uh, surveillance. It didn't have the experience in country programs, but maybe it could have acquired it. Uh, and the um, ECOFIN was supposed to be, the ECOFIN or Eurogroup was supposed to be competent. But uh, we were forgetting something, uh, is that the um, European construction uh, was not complete. And in fact, it was the member states, in particular Germany, who wanted the IMF in, because nobody really wanted to be the policeman in Europe. And the European Commission had lost some credibility because it didn't really uh, see the crisis coming. And the assessment of the Greek crisis at the very beginning was, was really uh, weak. They did not understand what was going on. So it was basically uh, uh, the German government who asked to have the IMF in. 
to be the policeman, to be the bad guy, uh, because nobody else in Europe wanted a bad guy. That was very unfortunate, but, um, but that's, that was the situation. So the Troika was created. I think the IMF wanted to be in. Some of the major shareholders wanted to be in because they didn't trust Europeans to be able to solve the crisis. So I think the, the US shareholder and others wanted to be in. Also, we should say the IMF alone would not have been able, would not have been sufficient because it didn't have enough money. And as you look at the disbursements, uh, the IMF disbursed only one third. And this was not the case only for Greece, it's the case for many other European crises. Uh, we forgot to talk uh, uh, often about Latvia, who started the crisis before Greece. And Latvia is actually the opposite case as the one which was told. The IMF uh, wanted Latvia to default, actually. Uh, Europe did not want. And Latvia was a very successful, is a very successful case. It's entering the euro in, in a few months. So it's a spectacular recovery uh, against all odds. Um, so that is, how would I say, the dilemma between a technical institution and a political one. And I think if the IMF wants to remain relevant in the world, it has to accept that in the end uh, the interests of its shareholders are important, uh, even though some of, its rule, some of the rule of the games sometimes uh, may, may need to be adopted and interpreted in a flexible way. And the fact that you need to, to have, to res always respect your rules or preconditions or your framework to make, to please the financial markets, in my view, is not necessarily uh, a good uh, reason. Now, the key issues are the conditions for which one should lend to a country. And if you look at the conditions, they talk about basically high probability of a country's debt being sustainable. Now, what does it mean, high probability? <clears throat> Who assesses this? What are the instruments? Well, the instruments are very weak because the sustainability of the debt of a country is very different from the sustainability of the debt of a company. It's not only objective criteria, it's political and subjective criteria. For instance, let me give an example. Privatization. Countries may commit to privatize but then they don't, or they change their mind, because politically they don't see the need. The same applies to the economy. Um, the, any debt sustainability is based on assumptions. Assumptions about the economy, assumptions about, um, uh, about the impact on the economy of, um, of uh, certain policies. And uh, these are based on models, and some of these models can be wrong in one way or in the other. So it's very, very difficult to assess with high probability. And in the end, if you assess with high probability that the country is sustainable, then the IMF becomes a bit irrelevant because you're lending uh, to a country that has no problem. You're asking yourself, why does the country have a problem? So you have, if you want to be in crisis management, you have to get your hands dirty. You have to be able to do something even when there is high uncertainty. And uh, we have seen this, and we see this every day. This crisis is, is quite special. It's the biggest crisis after World War II. It affects part of the Eurozone in a totally new uh, environment than the one for which IMF programs were based. Just to make an example, IMF programs are based on three years. It's totally uh, 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 irrealistic to think that any Eurozone country would adjust within three years, simply because without the exchange rate instrument, it takes much, much longer to adjust. So you need to bend these rules if you want to be relevant in Europe, otherwise, the IMF has to stay out and says, my rules prohibit me from addressing uh, 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 Eurozone countries. But if you want to be relevant, and the Euro area is the only area in the world where the IMF is intervening, you have to realize that your rules are not 
Correct. The same is for interest rates. The interest rate at which uh, the loans were made to Greece were wrong. They were based on add-on, on penalty rates, which were uh, calculated on the basis of much more dynamic economies. So all these things have to be changed if we want the IMF uh, to be relevant. Furthermore, if uh, you are a policymaker, you always have to look at the impact of your decision, but also the impact of not taking a decision. And that's uh, the problem every day, especially in monetary policy. And it may be that the impact of your decision is not the first best, is actually second or third best. And most of the time it is about gaining time. Gaining time for the other policies to start uh, adjusting. And it's clear that, uh, in my view, in May 2010, letting uh, Greece default or restructure the debt would have meant a series of uh, uh, consequences on the other countries which could have led to the breakup of the euro area. And I think it was appropriately appropriate that the IMF uh, understood this at the time, even though it pushed the interpretation to the limit that, of course, maybe we as economists would not like. But as policymaker, you have to take the risk because the alternative is the jump in the unknown. And I have to say, when I look at the IMF documents that have been uh, produced, uh, which incidentally say that the alternative to the Greek program would not have been less fiscal adjustment or more time. It would have been earlier debt restructuring. But then you ask yourself, do we have experience about debt restructuring? This is an important issue because, I mean, there are people in this country, for instance, which are talking about debt restructuring in Italy. And they don't know what they're talking about because debt restructuring, uh, they assume that it can be made, but we have no experience. When I look at the uh, uh, IMF document, they take two examples, there are only two examples of orderly debt restructuring. One is Uruguay, and the other is Jamaica. Now, the relevance of these two examples, you can imagine what it is, but let me just say that Uruguay had a debt uh, restructuring of only 10% of the value, and it was all foreign debt. Eh? And Jamaica is, is really irrelevant in terms of, um, of um, the, um, uh, uh, the country, the size of the country. I don't know what's going on, I'm sorry. Um, so um, debt restructuring, as we have seen in Greece, is a dramatic uh, situation. Why? Because in advanced economies, large part of the debt is held by domestic residents, by people, by, by savers, by poor savers, uh, and by the banking system. So what we have seen in the Greek case is that when you have a debt restructuring, the banks go down, they stop, they stop lending to the private sector, you have a credit crunch. So what you have to do to avoid that, you have to recapitalize the banks. And when you recapitalize the banks, where do you find the money? Well, you find the money either if the country gets out of, of the euro, and uh, finances the recapitalization of the bank with uh, central bank money, with inflation, or with external aid. So you see that this scenario is quite dramatic. So do you want to go into this scenario just to stick to uh, a theoretical framework which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work? I gave the example of Latvia. We can, uh, we can take the example of um, of Ireland and others where it worked. In Greece, it did not work. And I think it's important to understand why it did not work. And I think uh, maybe I should at a certain point stop, you tell me when. Yeah. I think it did not work for a series of reasons. First, because the state in Greece does not exist. We thought it existed, it did not exist in the sense that measures which were taken were not implemented. There was no administrative structure. So I could say without uh, offending uh, uh, our Greek friends that maybe Greece is more emerging market, developing countries than really an advanced economy. So 
one of the important elements on which people are working now is to rebuild the administrative. Just to give an example, they wanted to implement an IMU, in, uh, so a tax on housing, but they have no uh, uh, register. There's no public register on housing. So you just assume that you can implement a tax, and then you don't. Then if you don't implement this tax, you have to implement another tax. And of course, the other taxes are much more distortionary and have a very recessionary impact on, on the economy. So Greece did not correspond to uh, a, a typical country where the IMF intervenes for this type of crisis. It's more similar to structural uh, programs which require many, many years. The second point is that Greece has focused mainly on fiscal adjustment and not on structural reform. And in that respect, it looks like other countries in the euro area, which have followed the route of raising taxes instead of uh, making their economy more resilient and recover competitiveness. And this is, uh, is an issue which, which requires a lot of thinking, also in the IMF. After the Asian crisis, the negative reaction in Asia to the IMF was uh, too much structural conditionality. The IMF should deal only with fiscal policy, fiscal adjustment. I think the lesson from the Eurozone crisis is that adjustment in Europe without the exchange rate instrument has to be much more structural than fiscal. The problem is that structural requires a lot of time, so it requires a lot of money. So if the IMF wants to be relevant in Europe, I think it has to be ready to, to spend more money, and European countries are there to spend money, uh, and to understand what is the impact of structural reforms on, uh, on the economy. Of course, nobody wants to, to lend money to, um, uh, to countries which, in the end, will default. Uh, that's not the ideal situation. But in the end here, I think we are talking about trying to reduce, to reduce the costs of a, a, a very severe crisis, a major crisis. And that's what policy is all about, trying to achieve maybe second or third best. Because in this kind of world, I think first best is, uh, uh, is impossible to, to, to achieve. So um, I, I think I would not disagree, uh, I, I think, uh, what, what, what you have said is, is very relevant because we need to think and learn from experience. But just to say that we have to stick to rules and, and, and without flexibility, I think uh, is, a, is a risk because it may make the IMF irrelevant for Europe. And I don't think ultimately this would be, and this is a discussion by the way, when the IMF now comes out saying uh, taxpayers in the rest of the world of Europe have to pay, so you need a haircut. Uh, the taxpayers in Europe and the governments are saying, well, you know, this is our decision. We will decide when to do that. Don't tell us right now, because if you tell us right now, we are you are putting into difficulty our strategy and our ability to influence the Greek government. So uh, if you insist on that, then uh, we won't need you anymore. So is this a better world? Uh, maybe, coming back to my initial position, Europe should learn how to manage its own crisis without necessarily the IMF. But if the IMF wants to be relevant, it has to learn from experience and, I think, adapt some of its uh, terms and conditions. I would stop here. Uh, thank you.